Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning and welcome to this week's Wednesday class. Today it's on backyard and small orchard fruit. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Extension Agent here in Prince William County. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So the overall goal of today's class is to show you best practices for growing fruit. Um, with the emphasis on what's more practical to grow in our suburban landscape here in Northern Virginia. So when people talk about raising fruit in their yard, there's this expectation of beautiful fruit that just looks good and tastes really good. Unfortunately, the reality is without a lot of maintenance and care, we end up with what we see there on the right. Not so great fruits not very appetizing stuff and so what we want to do is set ourselves up for success and that's kind of what we want to talk about here today so one of the things that we want to do is consider right plant right place um, think about what species you want to grow what variety of that species you want to grow and what site you have and whether or not that species will work there um, when looking at varieties in particular, we want to look at things like disease resistance and do you need multiple varieties for good pollination? Um, the last thing you want to do is buy a fruit tree that needs cross-pollination, but you only buy one of that variety and you have all these trees, you don't end up with any fruit. So it's important to research your varieties to make sure you know what their needs are so that you can be successful. When we think about site considerations, you basically want full sun, good drainage, and ideally a slope. Ideally, we want trees towards the top of a slope because just like water, cold air drains to the bottom. And so having a tree higher on a slope allows for very cold air in a late frost to go down to the bottom and hopefully protect those trees from late frost damage. Not all of us can have slopes like that, but if you have property where that's a that's an option, higher on a slope is, is probably your better option. And then we need to think about maintenance. Um, what are the pruning requirements? How should we prune? And then do we need to thin the flowers? So flower thinning is done commercially and basically what it involves, just like it sounds, you go through and you thin out flowers. Why would you do that? Um, if you have too many flowers, you'll have lots and lots of fruit and that lots and lots of fruit might be too heavy for some of your younger branches and you might end up with damage because the branch just can't hold the weight of the fruit. And so particularly with younger trees, Flower thinning is something to consider. The other thing is competition. If you have tons of flowers, the fruit that it's going to produce, because everything's competing for resources, is probably going to be pretty small relative to what you would normally get. It's not always the case, but sometimes you run into that. So sometimes flower thinning is an option just for fruit size. Another thing to think about is chill hours. And chill hours basically are the annual hours where the temperatures are between freezing and about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so there are a number of fruits that need a certain amount of chill hours in order to produce fruit. And it's important to look at varieties that have chill hours relatively in the same group where you're living. And the reason for that is if, if you have a, a fruit that requires more chill hours than you typically have in your area, you're not going to get fruit or you'll get very little fruit. If you have a fruit that requires a lot less than what you normally get, what will happen is it will start to produce flowers before you wait well before your last frost and you're most likely going to get frost damage. So you want to find something that's relatively close to where you are. 
here in Virginia. Most of us are in this um, 180, or excuse me, 1800 shell hours. Um, typically, that's not a problem with a lot of our tree fruits, but you have to be careful with varieties of small fruits. Just something to consider. Um, and again, as you research your varieties, you'll have a better idea of what they need. Those are the big considerations. Let's take a look at some of the general types of fruit. Uh, generally, we break them up into tree fruit and um, small fruits. Generally speaking, and we'll go through why, um, most of our tree fruits aren't very suitable for where we are in Virginia. Um, but we break those up into palms, which are our apples, pears, and quince, our stone fruits, which is the cherry, peach family, um, and then uh, there's some others that don't fall in those categories like pawpaw and persimmons and things like that. And then with small, with small fruit, we have the cane berries, which are currants, blackberries, raspberries. We have strawberries, we have blueberries, and we have grapes. So tree fruits. Most of our tree fruits are pretty disease prone in Northern Virginia. I get calls from people all the time that want to put in an orchard on, orchard on their 10 acre lot and they want to do it organically. That's problematic. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second, but most of our, our tree fruits are disease prone. Most of them have insect issues. Um, and it's because of the climate. And so that requires intensive spray schedules. I think the spray schedule for apples um, is something like 15 applications a year. Organic usually takes three to four times more applications because they're not as effective and they're not as long lasting. And some of our organic mat, uh, options you have to reapply every time that um, you get heavy rain. So while organic would be ideal in our area with tree fruits, it's really difficult to do. Um, and so if you're gonna still wanna do tree fruits um, and you're gonna do it in this area, you really have to be careful about selecting varieties that are disease resistant. So there are a bunch of common issues with uh, our apple family, um, the big one is cedar slash pear slash quince rust. There are three different fungal infections that are all basically in the same family and they all act the same way. They bounce between fruit trees and cedar trees. And so in the colonial period, when they cleared the land, they planted a lot of Eastern red cedars because they made good fencing for uh, livestock because they grow so dense together. So we've got lots of cedar here. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit hard to get away from cedar. Um, so this rust is, is fairly common. And then we have all of these other diseases and I'm not gonna go into, I'll show you pictures, but I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail with them. But the bottom line is that our apple family has some issues. Um, this is what, rust looks like. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the upper right is an example of cedar quince rust, and the lower left is cedar pear rust. Um, but they all basically look the same, and they all do the same kind of damage to both leaves and fruit. Scab is another big issue. Um, it causes deformities on the fruits. There are a number of scab resistant varieties out there. Uh, fire blight, fire blight affects all kinds of fruits. Um, it damages the tree, it damages the fruit. You have bacterial ooze coming out of the fruit, which is kind of creepy and gross. Um, the lower center picture is the shepherd's crook that is um, indicative of fire blight, and you see fire blight not only on fruits, but you see it on things like roses and, and other ornamentals. Um, so there's lots of this disease in the area, and fruit trees are very susceptible to it. Powdery mildew, not that big a deal. Um, 
if it's not badly infected, but if you ever see apples that have this kind of netting pattern on them in the store, that powdery mildew at some point. Um, and most of the time in the apples, powdery mildew happens, you treat them, and so you don't get the, the nasty spores that you see on the apples in the lower picture. Uh, there are a variety of fruit rots that affect apples. Um, corking is another thing when you, you have these spots that are have no flavor to them. They're kind of dense and weird texture. Um, that's another disease issue we run into a lot. Fly speck and sooty blotch are fairly similar. Um, they just make the fruit look really nasty um, and they degrade the actual uh, inside fruit. There are also lots of common pests for our apple family, aphids, moths, spider mites, maggots, scylla, curculio, scale, and of course, the stink bugs. So aphids are a big problem. Um, codling moth lays its eggs inside uh, fruit and the larvae go and they chew up the inside and they make it rather nasty and their secondary infections because of that. Spider mites typically just affect the leaves and they reduce production. Um, apple mag maggots, that's another um, fly that lands, deposits its eggs in and those maggots will go and, and eat the fruit and degrade the quality. And in the lower center picture in that red circle, you can see that their maggots are very small um but they do a lot of damage there are a number of psyllids um, and psyllids attack both the stems the fruit and the leaves um, we run into a variety of psyllids both for uh, ornamentals and for fruit um, but there are lots of them out there and these aren't that difficult to control but again it's having a spray schedule um, curculio, even though it's plum curculio, will attack members of the apple family. Um, and you can see some of the damage that on the center and the right um, that it does to the fruit. That weird looking thing on the top of the fruit, on the picture on the left, that's the actual curculio. Um, and it's there laying its eggs. Scale is another thing we see in uh, tree fruits. Um, a lot of times it doesn't, you have to look really close to actually see the scale, but it causes um, this damage that's here on the right, um, discoloration, um, and also the fruit underneath that when you pull the peel back is going to be um, not flavorful and won't look right. And of course, everybody's favorite insect, the brown marmalade stink bug. Um, which is a sucking insect, so it will try and suck the juice out of your fruit and will leave these brown decaying spots where it's inserted its proboscis. So if we look at stone fruits, they too have lots and lots of different disease issues. Um, and stone fruits are even worse than the apple family. They get things like black rot, all sorts of blights, which affect leaves and fruits. They get a variety of rots. Um, one thing that you'll notice if you have uh, stone fruits, this picture on the far right, this weird misshapen fruit, that's called mum mummy fruit. And mummy fruit is a housing for disease. And so a lot of people just let the mummy fruit fall if you've got anything in the stone fruit family and you see this kind of fruit, you want to take that off, throw it in the trash, because if you let it stay on the tree or you let it drop to the ground, it's just going to reinfect the next year. Um, so sanitation with a lot of these diseases is really important. The stone fruit family gets all sorts of cankers, um, and sometimes it's indicative of other diseases, but you get this kind of sappy ooze that comes out that really looks unpleasant. Um, and basically, these are harbors for disease. The ooze that comes out is the tree trying to seal itself off. Um, 
but you get to a point where the cankers, which are housing bacterial infections, the tree just can't fight them off and the, the tree eventually dies. There are a number of leaf spots. Um, stone fruits also get scab. They get crown gall, which can affect the crown of the, of the tree. Um, it affects the roots and it affects the stems. And again, it's one of those things that it takes a lot of spraying in order to control. And so it also has tons of insect pests. There's fruit moth that again has a larva that eats the inside of the fruit, does the nasty things. Peach borers, which bore into the side of the tree. And you can see what they call gamosis, which is the picture on the right, that kind of sappy nastiness coming out of um, the tree. That can be a sign of borers or it's a sign of canker. And then our friend, the curculio. This is kind of a nasty little bugger. The spotted wing drosophila is a little fly that's really tiny. And what it does is it lays its eggs inside of fruit. The eggs hatch and become larva. And the larva eats the inside of the fruit. Most of the time, leaving the, uh, the peel, if you will, um, intact. And you don't realize you have a problem until you go to pick the fruit and all of a sudden all you have is, is the outer skin and there's no fruit inside. So this one's a, a relatively new one for our area, but um, so far we haven't had too much problem with it, but we do have this issue with um, stone fruits and berries. So with all that bad news, um, there is some good news. There are some tree fruits that have fewer problems. Pawpaw is a nice one. Pawpaw is actually one of those trees that will actually produce fruit in the shade. Um, red, red mulberry is another good one. There are actually three mulberries, the white mulberry and the black mulberry and the red mulberry, but the red mulberry is the native and it is the preferred species. Um, red mulberries can have their problems, but it's mostly birds eating uh, the mulberries and then pooping all over the place. Um, the American persimmon is another one. Um, there are two plum options, the beach plum and the American plum, surface berry, elderberry, and then figs, which you wouldn't necessarily think would grow well in uh, our part of the country or our part of the world for that matter. but they do very well. And so obviously you can see uh, a theme here that most of our tree fruits that don't have as many problems are going to be natives. And that's a good thing, not only because we're growing things that have less problems, but they also support um, our native insect populations as well. So if you've never seen one, this is a pawpaw. Um, the picture on the right is the papa when it's open. They have really big seeds, um, so you got to take those out. They're not edible, um, but you've got kind of like a banana custard flavor texture to them. Um, the tricky thing with pawpaws is getting them before the squirrels do. Um, now, there are some, most of the pawpaws you get are wild, um, but there are some cultivars being developed at the University of Kentucky. Um, which is promising, so they will probably have bigger fruit and more disease resistance. So we're looking forward to um, those being in widespread distribution. Right now, a lot of times you actually have to go to uh, U Kentucky to actually get some of those varieties. Red mulberry, in spite of its name, um, red mulberries will turn black when they are um, ripe. Uh, as I say, red mulberries are loved by birds, and so a lot of times they can, if you're going to have a red mulberry, don't have it near your driveway. Um, otherwise, your car is going to get covered. <laughs> so mulberries are interesting because they actually have three different types of leaves. Um, they start off with a mitten sort of shape, or excuse me, they start off with uh, this 
odd shape here on the far right. It moves to a mitten shaped leaf. And eventually over time, those leaves all become solid. Um, so that's one of the kind of peculiar things about mulberries. The American persimmon uh, is a beautiful tree. Um, University of Kentucky is also developing cultivars of this. Um, typically in the store, when you get Asian persimmons, they're going to look red like the center picture. Um, the problem with, with persimmons, um, particularly American persimmons, is they're bitter. And so what you have to do is you have to wait until after they get hit with a frost, and that will convert all that bitterness into um, sugars. And so once the mulberries have been hit with frost, they look a lot more like what you see in the lower right picture, and they will taste a whole lot better. Beach plum, um, these are small native plums. Ideally, you want two varieties for this. Um, from what I've read, the fruit is a little bit unreliable in how much actual plums you're going to get any given year. Um, they are an option. Their close cousin is also a native, is the American plum. A little bit bigger fruit. Um, the tricky part in our area with these two plums is that we are at the northern range of one and the southern range of the other. So depending on the microclimate in your yard, it may or may not work depending on which variety you get. Allegheny serviceberry is another native uh, tree that tends to grow better in the mountains, but we do see it. Uh, in Prince William County from time to time. Um, a lot of times service berry is used more for jams and jelly than uh, eating raw, but uh, it's, it's a nice native. It's a pretty tree. Um, and so it, it has, actually, I've never really seen a service berry with any sort of issue except maybe the occasional leaf spot. Elderberry Elderberry is really a shrub fruit more than a tree fruit, um, but you can see big elderberry trees over time. Um, elderberries are small, dark fruit. They are very flavorful. Um, again, it's another native. Um, there are some European elderberries as well. Um, both grow fairly well in our region. And of course, figs. Figs are... Uh, they say you wouldn't expect them to be in our area. There are a number of figs that do very well. Um, the University of Maryland actually has a publication on growing figs, which is really excellent. Um, figs are kind of interesting because if you eat a fig, you're also eating a wasp <laughs> because the wasps that pollinate figs actually go into the fig and die. Um, so there's a little extra protein from that wasp, but um, figs are very productive. They're very winter hardy. Um, a lot of times if you get winter damage with a fig, you can just prune that out. The fig will bounce right back. Um, so if you like figs, it's an excellent choice. I don't think I've ever seen an issue with um, figs in our area in terms of disease. Small fruits, on your hand, are much more... Um, much more conducive to the backyard orchard. Um, one, because it takes less space, and two, because we see lower pests and disease pressure. They still are gonna require pruning, and they're probably our best choice when it comes to fruit production for the average person, unless you wanna do a whole lot of spraying. So the cane berries, would be the ones that most people are familiar with are blackberries and raspberries. Um, but there also are dewberries and wineberries, which are natives. They don't have as big a fruit. Um, they don't have a whole lot of culti cultivated varieties like blackberries and raspberries. Um, and one thing to be to consider is that if you have uh, blackberries or raspberry cultivars growing in your yard and there are wild blackberries or wild raspberries growing nearby, there is a possibility of disease transmission. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. 
Um, blackberries and raspberries in particular, you can have thornless varieties, um, but you do need to be careful. Um, if you don't manage them with proper pruning, they get really out of control and they're very hard to get rid of once they get out of control. So the tricky part about cane berries is they have two types of canes. Well, they really have three canes, but two types that we worry about with fruiting. Primocanes are the first year canes and primocane varieties will fruit late on that first year and then they'll fruit again in the second year. These are more advanced varieties, um, our wild varieties and some of our other um, cultivars are fluorocane varieties. And with a fluorocane variety, they only fruit on second year canes. And so a primocane is, is your first year, a fluorocane is your second year. And depending on which variety you have depends on whether it will fruit once or twice. Generally speaking, only uh, raspberries and blackberries have primocane cultivars. The other ones don't. The other thing with all of the cane varieties is that once you hit the third year, they don't produce fruit. And so again, part of your pruning management is third year canes you get rid of. And so when the second, the second year after fruiting, you get rid of all those second year canes because otherwise they're just going to take energy away that you otherwise would get berries from the next year. Hopefully that, that I explained that well. <laughs> um, so again, two year canes should be removed off of uh, all varieties after they fruited. Um, with primocanes, with primocane fruiting varieties, you want to prune off the tips where they fruited the year that year, um, but not the whole cane. Um, the other option, particularly if you end up with cane borers, one thing you can do for disease management is with those primocane varieties, you can cut them down to the ground, get rid of those canes that are infected, and the next year, new canes will come up and then will fruit. So blackberries, um, typically you get dark fruit, uh, usually purple, um, dark red. Your fruiting season is late June to July. Um, I've got listed a number of cultivars. Um, some of our cultivars are, uh, are recommended cultivars. There are a number of them that are named after Native American tribes. There are a number of them that um, you'll see that are prime arc with a number. And that ARC refers to uh, Arkansas because the University of Arkansas does quite a bit of work on um, blackberry production and blackberry varieties. With raspberries, um, so raspberries are interesting because you get lots of different colors. Red raspberry, of course, are um, what we all think of with raspberries, but we do have dark purple ones um, which are sometimes referred to as black raspberries. And sometimes we can get uh, varieties that have yellow fruit. And their fruiting season is uh, late June to July as well. Um, some of the cultivars that are recommended for raspberries uh, are Caroline, Heritage, Killarney, and Nova. Um, the Folks at Virginia State University do a lot of work with small fruits, um, and so they're trying varieties all the time. And so uh, a lot of the information we get on what the recommended varieties are come from Virginia State University. Dewberries are more wild berries, um, as are wine berries. You see pictures of them. Uh, dewberries basically look like very small blackberries. Um, wine berries kind of look like um, almost like strawberries, really, um, but they're on canes instead of being a ground cover type plant. And of course, there, as I said, there are different varieties of raspberry, there are different varieties of blackberry. Um, there, are some, there are different sizes of blackberry. One of the things you'll notice if you do your research on the varieties that you select, 
Um, there are blackberries that can be as big as your thumb. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that when you select for something in a fruit, it's going to take away from another quality. So sometimes size doesn't always mean flavor. Another small fruit that's really popular and really conducive to our area are blueberries. Um, they are native to North America. Um, this is, they can self-pollinate, but they do best with two or more cultivated cultivars together. Um, and when you select cultivars, you want them in the same flowering group. They're early flowering, mid-season, and late flowering. And as long as they're in the same flowering group, it doesn't really matter what those cultivars are. And there are June's and July fruiting season. Um, they can be very attractive ornamentals. Uh, if you look at the picture, those are northern highbush blueberries um, in the fall. When you deal with HOAs that are very much, oh, you can't have fruit, you can't have vegetable gardens, blueberries are a good way to sneak them into your landscape um, because they do have a very ornamental feel to them. Now, blueberries prefer acidic soil, which is nice because most of our native soils are acidic, um, and they also do very well in containers. So there are a number of different types of blueberries. Um, the northern highbush blueberry, we're a little far south for that. The southern highbush is recommended for Virginia. Um, rabbit eye blueberries are also recommended for Virginia. They, uh, they aren't quite as sweet, um, but they look a whole lot like highbushes. Um, and they're the ones that are actually native to uh, Virginia. Southern high bush are native a little bit farther south. And then they're low bush blueberries. And these are lower growing. Um, if you ever get a package of blueberry muffins and you get the little can of blueberries and look like BBs, those are low bush um, blueberries. Um, the other blueberries, you know, are probably the width of your, your finger, um, but the low bush ones are like BBs. And all of the blueberries do really well, not a whole lot of problems in terms of pests. Um, and like I say, they do well in our acidic soil. And if you don't have a lot of space, you can put them in a container. Strawberries, typically the strawberries that we get are across a, of two varieties. Um, they tend to like being crowded, although you do have to thin them out after a few years. They are a spreading plant. Um, and they have two types of, of, of fruiting styles. There are June-bearing strawberries that fruit May through June, and there are ever-bearing strawberries that fruit May through September. Um, and both do well in our climate. Um, typically, the big issue that you run into with strawberries is there are some leaf spot issues, and then you always have the problem of wildlife coming and deciding that, ooh, strawberries, um, and getting to them before you can get to them. But if you have proper fencing, that's usually not a big deal. So the Ribes, which is the genus name, um, includes gooseberries and currants. Um, currants are more like a caneberry. Gooseberries are more like small bushes, although I've seen uh, gooseberries raised as trees. Um, basically, the way they prune them, they grow tall. Um, typically, they gooseberries are like cooler temperatures. They can get heat stress really easily. Um, my big concern with blueberries is as we're getting milder winters and warmer summers, they may not do as well as they used to. Um, there are two major species, the American gooseberry, which is much more disease resistant, um, but you also can find uh, European gooseberries in the nurseries as well. Currants, like I said, are sort of cane berries that grow as shrubs. They have lots of uh, different cultivars, um, red, black, and white varieties. Um, the black cultivars tend to need multiple varieties together in order to fruit properly. 
Currants and gooseberries are not as popular as some of the other small fruits. Uh, for gooseberries, for the longest time, they were banned. Um, and the reason they were banned is because they can host a disease that bounces from them, pine trees, and the, the Christmas tree industry didn't like that. So Christmas trees were more economical than gooseberries, so gooseberries lost. Um, but in the last decade, that's changed, and gooseberries are, you can get gooseberries and you can grow them here in Virginia. Currants are more something that we see in Europe than we do in the U.S., but um, it's a nice fruit. Um, it's a small shrub, and it's something to think about if you want something a little bit different. And here we have pictures of both gooseberries and a variety of different colored uh, currants. Chokeberry and chokecherry are two native um, shrub slash understory trees. Um, they're very. This is the exception when it comes to I got to find a site that isn't swampy. These two do well in wet areas. The big difference between the two is chokeberries typically stay red, although there is a black cultivar that's been introduced, and chokecherries stay black when or get black when they're ripe. These tend to be a little bit bitter, which is where the choke part comes. And so most of the time these are used for jellies and jams and not just eating by the handful. Although if you have kids that are into like sour candy, this might be an option for them. Another small fruit would be European grapes, and they are the small fruit problem child. Um, vinifera grapes are European. They are used as wine grapes, um, as well as most of the table grapes that you get in the store. They require trellising, and because they can get quite heavy, they require extensive trellising. Um, there's really, really heavy disease pressure in Northern Virginia. I know you drive around, you see all these vineyards. All of these vineyards are doing lots of spraying in order to get those wine grapes. They also have more insect pressure than most of our small fruits in, in the area. And again, they require an extensive spray schedule, an extensive spray schedule. So we don't recommend European grapes. However, if you really want grapes, there are some native opportunities. The Labrusca and the Rotifolia are native grapes. They typically are used as table grapes or for jellies and jams. Um, they can be used for wine, and there are some people who are working on trying to make wine specifically out of uh, native grapes. Um, probably the, one, the native grape you know best are Concord grapes. Um, they also require trellising. Most of them are dark colored. Um, and again, the probably the two most common ones you would know would be Concord grapes and Muscadine grapes. And so in the picture, the Labrusca representative we have here are Concord grapes. Um, and the Rotifolia, uh, Rotifolia, excuse me, grapes that we have on the bottom, those are Muscadines. Um, and they they do fairly well in this area. I haven't seen a lot of Concord grapes, but I know of at least one producer who does really well with his muscadines. Um, so that's an option. You know, uh, the only thing with muscadines, they tend to have uh, a thicker skin to them. Some people like that. Some people don't. I like them, but other people don't. Um, but that's something to consider when you're looking at native grapes. So cranberries. Cranberries are native, not to this part of the Atlantic. Um, they're usually not grown in southern regions, although you can. Um, if you really want to be adventurous, you can probably try and grow cranberry. Um, it's hard to find cranberries in, uh, locally, um, but it's something to consider if you want something a little different. If nothing else, it gives you nice foliage and nice berries for uh, wildlife. So once you have, um, once you have your fruit in in place, 
the big thing is, well, how do I protect it? And there are lots of varieties. You can see from this picture, um, with a lot of fruit, birds are the big problem. And so we have to think about birds. We have to think about small mammals. Um, these and, and deer as well. So all of these can be problematic. Oops. There we go. Um, so there are a number of types of repellents you can use. Um, audio repellents basically make noise. They're often on motion detectors. Um, problem is animals get used to it, and after a while they don't care. Um, mechanical ones are, again, usually on, on motion sec excuse me, they're usually on motion sensors or there's something that blow with the wind. Um, and again, animals tend to get used to it and only really deer and birds um, get affected by it. And these are, these can be as simple as, you know, having pie pans that are attached to a tree or stake and they wave and, and uh, flash color when the wind hits them. There are chemical repellents. Um, there are very, very few that can be applied to food crops, um, and they need to be reapplied regularly. And so generally speaking, we don't recommend repellents, although they are an option. Probably the best, um, the best way to deal with pests, um, large pests, is fences and netting. Um, you do want to make sure that you've got a proper size opening so that snakes don't get trapped in them. Um, you also want to think about, is my, my pest problem going to be something that will fly in or climb in? Um, so you want to make sure a lot of times that you have overhead coverage as well, like you see in these uh, small fenced in areas. Um, the other thing is you want to design your system for maintenance and in mind. I mean, if you look at these exclusion boxes here, you know, they're made of wood. It's fairly substantial to pick one up and move it out of the way to get in to weed that area. Um, so you need to think about that when you design your system. Trapping and removal is an option. However, a couple things. It's really hard to trap birds. Um, with mammals, well, actually, this is true of all wildlife. It is illegal to remove wildlife from your property without a permit. So if you catch wildlife on your property, you either have to release it back onto your property or humanely kill it. The Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources does have information on dealing with a variety of different pests but it also has a list of people who have permits who can come and take animals off your property and do it legally. There are lots of lethal deter deterrents, um, poisons and trap kills or kill traps rather. Uh, we don't recommend poisons because a lot of times poisons can get, well, they can hit non-target species and that becomes a problem. Um, kill traps are simple, easy, although you tend to have to get rid of the bodies. Um, the most common kill trap that we see is, you know, your standard old rat, tra rat trap. Now, if fruit is too much for you, there are other options. Um, there are a number of native nut trees that do very well. Um, Problem is, a number of them are really big. The walnut family, very big trees. Um, hazelnuts tend to be more shrub-like. Hickories can also be really large trees. Pecans, um, they're trees. The trick with pecans is you need to use short season varieties because we're a little far north. Williamsburg actually has a pecan festival every year. Um, William and Mary has quite a number of pecan trees. Um, so they do grow fairly well in the area. Um, so nuts are something else to consider. Some takeaways is that small fruits are going to do better for you than most tree fruits. 
native tree fruits are going to do a lot better than non-natives. Um, you need to really think about your varieties and look for things that are pest resistant. And the better you maintain your, your plants using good cultural practices, including pruning, the less likely they are to have disease issues. So I'm going to send this out, so I'm not going to read through all of the various recommended varieties, um, but there are lots of recommended varieties that do well in our area. Um, University of Maryland, Univer uh, Virginia Tech, and Virginia State have made lots of different varieties. And like I said, we'll pat when we put out the recording, um, we'll send you that list. Um, small fruits, large fruits, all sorts of things. Um, I also have a list of some references that might be handy that will go out with um, when we put it up on the web. Um, with that, I will take any questions that you have. If you have them in the chat or want to unmute and ask. There are several in the chat box, uh, Thomas. Uh, first one, can fire blight transfer from, say, a pear to an apple to a peach tree? Yes. And they can go to your roses and all the other susceptible um, plants. And like I said, there are lots of plants that are susceptible to fire blight. And next, um, Brenda's read about spraying a cinnamon spray on plants to treat fungus. Is that applicable on fruit trees? I have never heard of, well, I take that back. So typically cinnamon oil is used as an organic um, insecticide. I've not really heard of it being used as a fungicide. Um, so theoretically, if you have a cinnamon oil product that is labeled as a fungicide for fruit, you can use it. If it's not labeled for fruit, or you can't. Um, it's interesting because I've seen, <laughs> I've seen pretty much the same formula um, of different organics one was labeled as an insecticide, one was labeled as a fungicide, um, but you can't use the fungicide as an insecticide and vice versa because of the way the pesticide law is written. Um, but if, if you're going to use cinnamon oil as a fungicide, make sure you have a product that's labeled to do that. Um, just getting cinnamon oil and spraying it um, is probably not a good idea because depending on the concentration, it either may not work or it may actually harm the plant. So the next question is from Greg. Last year, he had a harvest of apricots. This year, nothing. It's the frost, yes. And can I protect from frost? Probably frost. Um, protecting against frost is a little bit tricky. Um, a, you got to watch the weather. Um, what they do in Florida, actually, to protect from frost is when they know that there's going to be a frost, they go out and they spray the trees with water. And while that seems crazy, because of the amount of energy it takes to go from water to ice, a lot of that cold energy gets sucked up in that water and it doesn't harm the fruit. Um, that is probably the best way that I can think of to do it, unless you have them in big pots and you take them inside, which isn't practical in a lot of cases. The other thing you could think of if it's small enough, you know there's a frost coming, throw a blanket over top of it to insulate it. And that little bit of insulation can also help um, particularly if it's not a really, really hard frost. So the next question is, could you pot compost the mummy fruit, or would that also introduce the same disease back into the new composted soil? I would not risk it. I would, would not at all risk it. it. You're far better collecting all of that and 
putting it in a trash bag, sending it to landfill, or burning it. Um, yeah, I, I would not put it in compost. Even in a hot compost, I wouldn't put it in. Can anything be done to help trees with cankers? In most cases, you're better cutting them down and replacing them, quite honestly, especially if they got a lot of cankers. Um, I mean, there are some pesticides, but they don't actually heal the cankers. And as long as you have those cankers, they're going to be um, they're going to be incubators for disease. And the next question is, should the rotted fruit that drops from the tree be trashed or can it be composted? So when if we're talking about fruit that has just fallen off and, you know, it's it's rotted because that's a part of its natural process um, or a squirrel took a bite of it and dropped it onto the ground, that stuff can be composted. It's really if something is disease on the tree, that's the big issue. And you do want to collect all of that, that fruit that's dropped because if you leave it there, it becomes a host for um, pathogens as well. And so again, sanitation with tree fruit is really important um, to help prevent or at least reduce disease pressure. The next question is, are wild blueberries able to be grown in Virginia? So wild, quote, wild blueberries are the low bush blueberries um and they uh they would do much better in the uh, coastal plain um particularly yeah in the coastal plain probably because they really like sandy soil um you could try i don't know anybody who's grown low bush blueberries and part of the reason is because like i said the fruit is like bb sized um so for a lot of people, it's just not worth it. Um, but yeah, you could try it. The only thing I wouldn't recommend would be the northern high bush because I think, especially with the way the climate has shifted, I think we're really too far south to go with northern high bush. But the other ones, you, you can. Um, and like I say, if you're gonna if you're gonna try low bush, I wouldn't invest a lot into it. Um, see how it works. And then if you want more, um, go ahead and get it. Just make sure you get success first on a small scale. Uh, the next question is, how can fig trees be best protected when overwintered? Can burlap covers work? It can. Um, It's rare that you get really significant winter damage on fig trees. Um, but yeah, you can throw a sheet or blanket or burlap over them. Um, the tricky thing is that when you have warm days, you want to make sure you take that covering off and let it dry out a bit. Um, because the last thing you want to do is create a warm, humid environment underneath it um, so that you start getting disease pressure, even though it's in the middle of the winter. Um, but yeah, you can cover them. And I know people who've had severe winter damage on their fig trees. They've cut them to the ground, and in the spring, within a year, they're back up and in good shape. So um, figs are, 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 I don't know what the right word is, but figs can be quite durable. Um, but yeah, you can protect them from, from freeze damage, but a lot of times you really don't need to. Um, the next question is, do you recommend mulching newly planted apple trees? I have heard this encourages rodents. So the thing with mulch is that if you have a mulch layer that's too thick, what's going to happen is you're creating an environment for a rodent to make a burrow in. And so 
Um, a lot of times, so just from a landscape perspective, a lot of times what we see is we get calls from people, oh, I got snakes everywhere. Well, why do they have snakes? Because they've got lots of rodents. Why do they have lots of rodents? Because they have mulch that's four and five inches tall. And in the wintertime, um, that's a nice convenient place for the rodents to hang out. So if you are mulching correctly, probably no more than about two inches of mulch, you're okay. If you start getting deeper than that, you're creating a habitat where um, where the the mice and what have you are probably going to want to invest themselves in the winter time and because there were the trees right there that trunk can be something that they're going to gnaw at um but i've ne i've never heard of anybody who, who does a standard kind of thinner mulch have problems with rodents because of the mulch Uh, one more question. When a fruit tree, like a pear tree, has obvious fire blight, what would you do to address it? Well, I would start by pruning it back severely. Um, you want to go at least a foot back from where you have signs of fire blight. Um, get rid of all that material, bag it, burn it, whatever. Um, and then... Um, Typically, what I would do in that situation is I would prune it and then look at the spray schedule, and I don't know what it is off the top of my head, um, and spray it the following spring for fire blight. And if, you know, depending on how badly it was originally infected, it, the tree should bounce back. Um, but if it's like all over the plant, then you're going to have to replace it. And ideally you wouldn't replace it with the same family. So if you've got a pear tree that's got fire blight, don't replace it with a pear or an apple. Um, go with a different fruit family. Uh, one more question. Do you have favorite tools to trim fruit trees. Uh, I've seen people use Japanese saw to trim large branches. Um, no, not really. I mean, there are all sorts of tools and it's more about, um, to me, as long as the tool's sharp and it's comfortable in my hand, um, I'll use it. But a lot of people have personal preferences. Um, and basically, as long as you're pruning correctly, doesn't matter what tool you use. Um, I go for comfort just because you're more likely to make a good cut if it's something that ergonomically works for you. Okay, that was the last question, unless anybody has any more questions. And unmute or you can put it in the chat box. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all for coming. And if you have further sorry about that. If you have further fruit questions, please let us know. Happy to answer them. Um as I say, you know, we have resources. We also have the advantage to reach back to Virginia State uh, with the small fruit specialist or the Winchester Research Station with the tree fruit specialist to help get um, help get good varieties for you and to help get uh, advice if you run into problems. So uh, feel free to reach out um, next month. Don't remember the exact date, but in August, our class is going to be on container gardening. Um, my colleague Valerie is going to be giving that class, and we look forward to seeing you then.